So now it is afternoon, so good afternoon. <laughs> and remembering that we're uh, honoring two presidents, uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Here's a little something from Abraham Lincoln that seems fit for this afternoon. The probability that we may fail in the struggle ought not to deter us from the support of a cause we believe to be just. That seems to be very appropriate for our conversation about civil rights in the United States. Um, we ended the conversation in the first panel having looked at the double V victory, the World War II, uh, the Cold War, the personal uh, responses of people like Ernie Green of the Little Rock Nine to what was happening in terms of the violence, uh, and the movement by both Truman and Eisenhower, though they not be supporters of social equality, to do some things that move the country forward with regard to civil rights. And so now we come to the terms of uh, John F. Uh, Kennedy and Lyndon Baines Johnson, typically regarded by people who think of the modern civil rights movement as two presidents that were very much associated with civil rights. We think we know those stories. And the question on the, on the program is to ask how legislation was moved forward, what were the forces that inspired the legislative process by these two uh, presidents to advance actual civil rights legislation, and we certainly have the panel to do that. So let's start with, because I like a little context, as after we leave Eisenhower, and now it's John F. Kennedy's time, what was happening in the country in terms of uh, the NAACP, in terms of what lawyers were doing, Kenneth Mack, uh, in terms of the restlessness of the black community about where civil rights was? Because the Little Rock Nine, that was considered a, a victory of sorts, but yet we were so far from legislation. So Kenneth Mack, I think I'll start with you. Okay. All right. What Put the context for us, yeah. What was going on in the country? Uh, several things. Uh, first, the uh, Brown decision had been decided. It had been unevenly enforced. There had been the Little Rock crisis. But really, nobody knew uh, whether and when or how school desegregation would really happen in the South. Um, the Justice Department um, was trying to enforce existing civil rights laws, but there were holes in existing civil rights laws. Um, it was mentioned earlier that uh, uh, under President Eisenhower's watch, the 1957 Civil Rights Act was enacted, the 1960 Civil Rights Act. They gave the, Ju the Justice Department uh, additional powers to uh, enforce civil rights, but, but really still very, um, very significant constraints on what the Justice Department can do. The NAACP is caught up with the struggle of trying to implement Brown versus Board of Education and, um, and then there's Martin Luther King, who was catapulted to prominence with the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 and 56. But King is also looking in 19, 1960-61 uh, for ways to push the movement forward. So what the, the context was that a, a lot had been done, desegregation of the military, Brown versus Board of Education, um, the John, President Kennedy and Robert Kennedy were both racial liberals. They were, they were actually comfortable with social equality. Uh, they were personally comfortable around African Americans, which was a, which distinguished them from most of the predecessors um, in the office of the presidency, but still nobody knew what the next step was. And in fact, the next steps were driven by things and people who were outside of the office of the President of the United States, outside of the executive branch. They were driven, the next steps were driven by African Americans and whites, segregationist whites in the South. So Harris Walford, um, John F. Kennedy first had to get the presidency. And part of his acceding to the presidency, he had to deal with some of the issues of civil rights. Some of this, what was going on that Kenneth Mack has just described, that. Uh, after Eisenhower's presidency. How did he do that, and how did he view civil rights at that point as a candidate before he actually got into the chair as president? One day, um, shortly after I was hired by Kennedy 
uh, I'd been campaigning for him um, uh, on foreign policy grounds, even though he had supported the jury trial amendment in 1957 of the, of the first civil rights act since reconstruction. He was in trouble, but I was uh, ardently for Kennedy on foreign policy grounds. Um, he picked me up on a corner in Georgetown. Uh, he knew I had joined the staff by then um, and hadn't known anything about civil rights background I had had with Dr. King and promoting civil disobedience, talking about it at least, since uh, writing a book with my wife on India and Gandhi, et cetera. And he said, now in 10 minutes, uh, pick, tick off the things that I ought to do if, if I'm president to clean up the damn civil rights mess. So I, I had my moment. I had my 10 minutes. And, and, um, What'd you say? Uh, well, among other things, I said, <laughs> with one stroke of a pen, you can sign the executive order uh, eliminating discrimination in, rich, in federally assisted housing that the Civil Rights Commission had recommended and was sitting on Eisenhower's desk for six months or something like that with one stroke of a pen. He said, I like that. Uh, you know, we talked about the, the problem of the Southern legislators filibustering any legislation. So he jumped at the idea of executive action. And I had five or six other points. A few days later, he called me in and said, uh, Sergeant Shriver has convinced us that we should have a civil rights section of the campaign, not just a minority vote section, but a civil rights section that would have um, black and white leaders and Hispanic leaders, uh, Walter Ruther and Menon Williams and uh, all the black leaders that we could get to actually join the campaign. And we, we've learned about your ties in those years would you go down and work with Sergeant Shriver, who I already had gotten to know uh, separately and, and knew that he was somebody I enjoyed more than anything I, for the next 10 years that I've had in my life. So night and day, we were in the civil rights section. Uh, a key part of it was the Democratic platform, which was the most far-reaching uh, political civil rights platform uh, that any party had ever had even the Republicans and their abolitionists blooming. Um, it, it was an extraordinary one that went even further than they wanted because, <laughs> because Chester Bowles was the, the, the chair of the Democratic Platform Committee and he assigned several of us to, on civil rights to have a maximum platform and then a minimum that we would fight for because he knew he would have to compromise with the Southerners and he wanted to have the maximum and, and we, had a, we had good two ones, the minimum, maximum. That morning, Robert Kennedy got up on a stair, a, a chair in the caucus of the Democratic, Democratic leaders on the floor and said, today's the day for the platform and uh, the civil rights platform is strong and uh, we want the Kennedy delegates, every one of them, to go all the way with Bowles' platform. I went and reported to Bowles that that was the command. And if, he said, my God, I don't know what will happen. And the Southerners didn't balk. And the whole maximum uh, got adopted somewhat by accident, which Kennedy avowed and campaigned on a number of times. And, and, and then came the call to Mrs. King. Uh, and then in due course, I, I became an assistant to the president for civil rights, having first urged Louis Martin, our key colleague, his African-American wonderful colleague in, in my lifetime, and uh, they wanted him in the Democratic National Committee. And the, um, twice on the edge of signing the executive order on housing, the southern legislators came to him and said, first, if you sign that, we will not support your housing and your economic plan. And then second time he delayed it, uh, they came and said, we're all up for election. And if you, we're gonna lose the South or a lot of us if you sign it. 
twice when I was booked to go and explain the executive order on Martin Agronsky's radio show, um, he canceled at the last minute. Uh, and the pens started flowing from, from um, the, civ the civil rights movement decided to send pens saying one stroke of a pen. And allegedly when uh, the strokes, uh, when the pens came in, the first huge bundle, um, he said, send them over to Wofford. He got me into that. But <laughs> on, on, on executive action, mm -hmm. he formed a sub-cabinet group on civil rights, which he asked me to chair, in which every cabinet department uh, had to have a member of the sub-cabinet committee on civil rights. We met regularly to find out and to move and to support each other in how much each department could do. So, Ken so, Kennedy so, launched it, mm. supported it, and uh, then the Freedom Riders rode. So you would say he was good on civil rights? I'm just giving you a beginning I, I, of I the asked story. the question. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to get you to characterize it, because before we well, get I, to, yeah. I, I came in due course to realize that what um, many thought was weakness or uh, unreadiness. Uh, gradualism. Gradualism, et cetera. Um, Al Sharpton on uh, interviewing Chris Matthews um, said, you know, your book has convinced me I was wrong that he was just a gradualist and didn't have a commitment to civil rights. I rec recommend his book because just looking at it cleanly now from the Democratic platform to the call to Mrs. King to the executive actions that were taken to um, the uh, two weeks after the worst violence of the Freedom Riders, uh, the order to the, ins to the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission was to design regulations that will end segregation in interstate housing, which is mm -hmm. the happy end of that story. Um, uh, going through his submission of the civil rights bill so, and, so, and the so great So not gradualism speech. for you, pretty good. Okay. Let's let, let's let it sit there for just a second. You're, I'm going to go over to, you're, you're go the to Roger. You're the moderator. <laughs> I'm going over to Roger for uh, a second to talk about uh, if you could pull together the middle of this thread. So Kenneth has talked to us about what's happening. Uh, there is a there is a ongoing, pers I would say, persistent thought that Kennedy came late to civil rights, uh, despite what he may have said on the campaign trail and despite what uh, Harris Wofford has just told us about his setting up the Civil Rights Division. You work for, for Kennedy and Johnson. Uh, I wonder if you could pull, pull that middle together for us and give us your assessment of where he was. Uh, and did you see him as a gradualist? You asking me? Yes, you. <laughs> If I saw the president as a, you couldn't be black and alive after Ernie and his schoolmates and other black youngsters in the South um, on freedom rides. And they're getting their heads whipped because they want decent education. And the president is, is nominating judges who you wouldn't jump over the moon to put on the bench if you were me. Personally, I thought I, I worked for Kennedy in the campaign, and I never supported a Republican, a Democrat all the way. When I got to the to Washington, there was a sense that I had that many of the white guys who were in charge of running the civil rights, present company <laughs> excluded, <laughs> really weren't steep deeply in it and how deep and nasty and hard and mean 
the racism in this country still was. And pretty words weren't going to fix it. And it made it impossible for me to, first of all, continue as a lawyer who was going to make some money, which I, turns out I didn't do, um, to my voice, I'm happy dismay. <laughs> uh, but you couldn't, you couldn't live in this society, this heated racial society, and not get in it, and get in it with force and, and, and effort. And I thought, I thought that the candies were nice people for being so rich. <laughs> but that they didn't really understand the depth, the Americanism, and the awfulness of America's racial problems. And you, there wasn't no quick thing to do. Some clever, say, oh, get Mac. I have, have Mac Bundy come in here and say something clever, and maybe we can figure out how to do this. That's not how you could do it. There was no way to do it but for people to get into the trough and go and use years and years and years, all of their lives, to change them. And I would say that though, and there was, there were, there, you have, to, you have to be honest about these things. This is not good. what the next sentence is not going to be a very nice one. But it was really hard to get into, to try to get into civil rights and make it better and get the administration to do more. When you got the sense that you were moving around in several conglomerations of fairly arrogant white guys, who, many of them who had never had anything to do with race at all until they got in the thing and working for County Ness. Now, Heifer, Harris, Harris was, is, is, you have my exculpation. You're not a bad, you, you're not, you weren't. And he was, he was one of the white guys that people could go to early on in uh, uh, the president's term. He was the good guy. But there were a lot of guys who just wanted to be near the top. And guys who didn't know a lot. So I got lucky. I got a, made a contact inside the White House, Ralph Dungan. Remember Ralph? And Ralph, I would go and uh, he was assistant to the president, a nice guy. He, I was in foreign aid, and Ralph would come or have me come, and we would talk about issues at the top of the foreign aid program. And then it always turned to race. And then I would, <laughs> then I would really argue hard and say the president needed to be pushed. And one of the things I used was stroke of the pen. Mm. We believed it. Where's the pen? What's he doing about it? And then you had the president when he's, uh, you remember that the president when he was um, campaigning had gone to uh, Alabama and had seen the governor, his name was Patterson. And the president-elect said, oh, he's a man I can work with. Well, Thurgood Marshall, who was a close family friend of ours, I grew up with knowing him, and he said, to me, what is the president saying that for? That man's a rat. <laughs> He's just terrible. 
he is, it, he's going to make such trouble in Alabama. The president is, most feeling was not expressed that harshly. But it was feeling that this administration was feeling its way. And that this, this, the attorney general, who was in charge of this stuff, was being a tough guy. And the, that's, the administration was full of tough guys. Is he tough enough? Was one of the things that people asked was somebody was as being um, nomin or examined for a job. Let me ask this question, because before I get uh, Charlene into this conversation, because you've said something that's very important, particularly after our first conversation, and that's about the appointment of federal judges. Uh, whereas a, an Eisenhower worked very carefully to make certain that the judges he put in place were pro-civil rights to the extent of his ability, Kennedy did not do that. As a sop to those right. Southerners, if, of which you, one you speak of right now, he appointed segregationist judges. The impact of that, Kenneth Mack, if you would. Well, the impact of it was huge. Um, <coughs> so just to take one of the judges he appoints, uh, Harold Cox in Mississippi. Uh, Harold Cox was proposed to the Eisenhower uh, Justice Department as a judicial appointment, and Herbert Brunel laughed when he heard Harold Cox's name. You couldn't possibly appoint this guy. Um, um, when Kennedy comes in, Harold Cox gets appointed. Uh, Cox was probably about the worst of the lot, but there were many like him. And the, Kennedy's problem was that the Democratic Party still was, in part, the party of the South. Eisenhower did not have that problem. So Kennedy had a number of Southern senators, segregationist senators, and he had to decide whether he's going to do something that will make them unhappy because they can make his life unhappy also by blocking his legislation, by uh, riding herd on f federal administration, by depriving programs of money. And you know, it's, it's one of many instances where it requires uh, uh, a little bit of confrontation. And um, uh, the president and the attorney general shied away from that co confrontation and appointed a number of segregationist federal judges in the South. And this was very, very important. One thing that people don't understand that, you know, we understand the role of the judiciary in Little Rock. The role of the judiciary was always key in the civil rights movement. Civil rights protesters get arrested. Are they going to get out of jail? We're going to have a protest. Will there be an injunction against the protest? Um, state courts want to enjoin a protest. Are the federal courts going to act? <coughs> And in fact, even as far back as the Montgomery bus boycott, what pe most people don't know is that, in fact, the federal judiciary helped save the Montgomery bus boycott because they won the boycott because they filed a lawsuit. And they got it in front of the federal judiciary. And uh, eventually, the US Supreme Court declared the Alabama segregation statute unconstitutional. So federal judges were going to be key in whether or not the movement was going to succeed or fail in the South. And the Kennedy administration put a number of federal judges in who um, issued rulings that were contrary to law. Uh, Harold Cox would, ish, would speak in racial epithets from the bench, um, you know, would refer to African Americans as monkeys and things like that from the bench. And this was someone who Kennedy put in. And in fact, the judges who the Kennedys liked, of course, were the Eisenhower appointees on the Fifth Circuit. Because when the district court judges invariably ruled against them, they had to go to the Eisenhower judges in the Fifth Circuit to get um, basic constitutional rights for African Americans in the South. So the federal judges were key. Can I continue this, just on this road, because it, it when you are sitting inside the government and you're seeing that and it's your party and your president, you're in a terrible mess. And so you have to do what you have to do. And it is to point out 
to the President of the United States that he wasn't, they weren't responding to Ernie Green and, and his colleagues. You look at the picture of Elizabeth Eckford, then that girl yelling at her and screaming with her face all interred by ra 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 rage. Again, you gotta say, come on, government that I work for, come on, move and do something. And I would say it in words. And then I decided this, I, this and Ralph would say, write it, Roger. Roger, I, I, you know this stuff, but I don't know this stuff. You write it. So I said, all right. So I'm writing it, and I said, I'm going to break my career right. Break my career right. <laughs> and then I finally said to myself, what do you need to do? I said to myself, what are you? A man or a, lunch, a, a, a bunch of you can't ask yourself that question if you're not ready to give the right answer. <laughs> and I did give the right answer and by my lights, and it came back from Bob Kennedy like a rocket out of a, of a thing you knock down t uh, tanks with. It was really, it was really tough. He's green. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He'll certainly never get a, uh, an appointment in this department as long as I'm uh, Attorney General. Let me get Charlene into this conversation. Let me in just, this, oh, do? Okay. <laughs> okay. I just, I just want to say that that changed some stuff. And the, all I can, I'm trying to say in this that what the people on the street were doing and their demands and their pressure and their enlightening, and particularly the young people, and you say, you've got to do it. You've got to change things to respond to these people, period. I'll be quiet. Okay. <laughs> so we're talking about... <clears throat> The one-two combination of street versus court, and Kenneth Mack has told us about what's happening legislatively. Um, uh, Roger Wilkins has told us what's happening inside the administration as well as, as Harris Wolford has told us the same kind of thing, and I think that's important to know. Let me just, if I can, parenthetically explain who Elizabeth Eckford is for those who do not know. Elizabeth Eckford was one of the students who was going to be a part of the desegregation of uh, Central High School along with Ernie Green and the rest. She's ca captured in that iconic photograph where there is a woman screaming at her and there's a mob behind her and she's trying to get on the bus. Uh, by way of running us up to this point in time, there's a wonderful <coughs> book by David Margulik now talking to both Elizabeth Eckford and the woman screaming at her, so you should read that book. Now, going back to the streets versus the court, because what we have going on here are people who have become black history, like Charlene Hunter Gull, who are watching this and seeing this and wanting to be a part of the energy that Ernie Green uh, talked about. Uh, and you become a pivotal part of this story of pushing the Kennedys toward looking and dealing with civil rights in the way that they, that to that point, John F. Kennedy had not. Uh, tell us the story. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> um, I'd sort of like to pick up where Roger left off because as I listened to all of the people talk about what was going on inside, I kept thinking about the young people in this audience and I want to say to them that it was young people like you who changed the minds of the Kennedys. Those young people, I just did all this research for this book I'm going to promote in a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> But I, I'm living with this now in a way that I didn't even live with it when I became the first black student at the University of Georgia. That was, to me, a solitary thing. But I was encouraged by what else was going on with the students in the movement. We had the president of Ernie and the Little Rock Nine and, and Ruby Bridges who would, over in New Orleans who was, who was even, in a way, more poignant than you guys because you guys were at least 11th and 12th grade. I mean, she was in the 5th or 6th grade and she had to walk through this mob first grade. And, um, you know, we talked about 
the continuity of history. I mean, when, when Barack Obama was running for president, he went to Selma. And one of the things he said there was, I stand on the shoulders of giants. And I was so happy to hear him say that because as Ernie said and others have said, black people have been struggling for equality since they were brought over here in chains. And, and, it, and, and it built and it built. And, and as I was writing my book about the students who actually did change the minds of the Kennedys, um, I had to go back to all of those people in the NAACP and other organizations who had been quietly working since those guys came back home, including my father, who was in the Truman Army, who, who, who held the, the heads of black soldiers who were shot on the battlefield, and yet they couldn't come back home even injured and enjoy any of the privileges of the other whites. So all of that had been going on and germinating and simmering. And so, you know, when these young people hit the streets, starting in, uh, in, in, uh, in Greens Greensboro mm -hmm. in 1960, when they sat in at the lunch counters, um, that unleashed young people all over the South and eventually in the North because in order to get the attention of the Kennedy administration, they got white kids from the North to go and study nonviolent protests in, I think it was in Ohio, and, and some of them went south to do sit-ins and demonstrations, et cetera. Some of them were sent to Washington because they were white and they thought that they could get the attention of the white administration with a couple of exceptions here. Uh, to, to, to protect those young people who were demonstrating for equal rights in the South. Now, all of this was happening as I applied to the University of Georgia. I don't think it was necessarily the school desegregation stuff at that point. Uh, when I entered in 61, uh, it was the first successful desegregation of higher education at that point in the South. And Robert Kennedy came to my college, University of Georgia, I desegregated in January of 61, by a, and the desegregation order was given by a white Republican <laughs> judge, uh, William Boodle. And um, Kennedy came in uh, May of 61 to speak at the Law Day uh, ceremony. And, and by this time, there had been a consciousness raised, the consciousness of the administration had been raised to a certain extent and, and so the, 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 the um, state representatives, none of the top officials of Georgia would attend because they were afraid of what Bobby Kennedy was going to say. And so here I was, one of two black students on a campus of 20,000 who had rioted when we went into the university, but that calmed down after about three days. We didn't have to have Ernie's uh, troops uh, come in. Uh, so, so Kennedy comes, is coming, and I'm saying, I really want to hear what he has to say, especially since all of these Georgia legislatures were so concerned about what he was going to say. So I spoke to a, a, a sympathetic uh, a professor, most of whom didn't speak to me at that point, but he did. And so he got me into the room. And, and sure enough, he started with the whole notion of the Cold War. That was his context for saying that you have to obey the federal laws. And then, and I wrote about this in my first book, I was sitting in the, in the somewhere, you know, invisible uh, in, the, in the class of, a room of maybe two or three hundred students. And all of a sudden, I heard Bobby Kennedy had talked about how the South had helped deliver his brother and a few other things. I think I quoted part of the speech in my book. And then I heard him say, because I'm just sitting there saying, oh, this is very interesting. Mm, Cold War, Soviet Union, communism, democracy. And then he said, the graduation of Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes from this university will be a major step in our war against communism and, and the Soviet Union and, and, and communism. And I said, excuse me. <laughs> At which point I was no longer invisible because everybody turned around and looked at me <laughs> in the room. So, and then he went on to, to articulate in the clearest terms, I think, that any 
a federal official at that level had done to say that the primacy of federal law will be supreme in this country and you're going to have to obey the law whether you like it or not. At which point there was sort of grumbling and mumbling and when he finished, I think I was probably the only person who stood up, maybe Hamilton Holmes, the other black student, we were <laughs> applauding wildly. And so I said to my professor, I have to meet this, this man. So he said, well, come, come with us. And so afterwards at the reception, I was introduced to him and he just, you know, it was very sort of friendly, you know, nice to meet you. And I said, I, I like what you had to say about that communism thing. And, uh, <laughs> and, and he sort of smiled. Um, and that was, that was, but that was, in, that was in 1961. Up to that point, these young people when John Lewis left Howard University on a Trailways bus to go on the first Freedom Ride, he left his will behind because he thought that there was a real possibility and he was right. He wasn't killed, but Goodman, Cheney, and Swerner were. And so they, those young people left their wills behind. And they had strategies. And the Freedom Riders were, were really trying to get the attention of the federal government to, 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 to get these states to uphold the law, which went back to the Boynton decision, and maybe even before. You lawyers can help me with this. It's in this book, but I can't remember all of that. The book. Um, but, but there had been decisions going back to the 40s that ruled out segregation on interstate commerce. But there was still uh, 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 segregation on the buses. The blacks still had the back seat. So this uh, freedom rides were aimed at forcing the federal government not to create anything new, but to enforce the law. And it took these young people, fearless and ready to die, in order to get the attention of the federal government. And even once they did, I mean, there were little, you, you can read about it in my book. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but it's true, because I did research that I didn't even know in order to, to uh, explain the role of young people in making America live up to its promise of e equality for all. And we talk about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King didn't start the movement. He was one of many and it was, it, you know, there were tensions between these young people in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the NACP. NACP no was kidding. upset because when these young people would get arrested, they would have to go bail them out and pay the money, but they didn't want to listen to the NACP in terms of how they were doing things because the NACP was gradualist, important because they were winning cases like the 1954 Brown decision, but the, it, that was a slow process. And these young people were saying, we got to move faster. We, 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 the 1954 Supreme Court decision said, with all in separate but equal, the lie of separate but equal, with all deliberate speed. And when I applied to the University of Georgia in 1959, that was four years later, no deliberate speed. So these young people were saying, the time is now. And as Martin Luther King used to say, the time is right to do right. And so they forced even King to be more uh, a militant. When King got arrested in Atlanta, protesting with the students, uh, it was a, he didn't plan to get arrested, but he did. And, and upscale and, black people and, in Atlanta didn't expect well, it. Well, no, but, but there were a lot of black older people. Then, and you had these schisms because you had, uh, uh, you had courageous black people who had been fighting for generations for equality. But you also had those who, who, who had been tormented and, 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 and beaten and killed and all kinds of, when they looked for Goodman, Cheney, and Swerner in the, and eventually found them 40 some days later in the river, in the process they found so many other black people who had been murdered and nobody even knew where they were. So, you know, things were going on even before King and Rosa Parks and, and they deserve all the credit. But all of those unknown giants on whose shoulders oh, President, then candidate Obama said he was standing, they were nameless people fighting. But the young people 
in the South in the 60s were the ones who forced the Kennedy administration to do what was right, and ultimately they did. So let me uh, talk about what became a signal event of young people that, that pushed uh, John F. Kennedy uh, to then get this civil rights legislation through. And you've mentioned the Freedom Riders and their incredible story, but I want to uh, broaden out the question in this way. How did a man who during his campaign, Harris Wolford said, praised the sit-ins, the sit-ins them which you referred to in Greensboro, said, this is, if, you, if, you, if you've got to go for freedom, sometimes you have to sit down. This is, a, I'm paraphrasing his quote, how does he go from there to appointing segregationist judges to upsetting Roger Wilkins and to being pushed, pushed, pushed uh, until the freedom rides with the brutality visited upon those freedom riders really made him then uh, move uh, to do something in terms of concrete legislation? First place, it isn't just the Kennedys that had to be moved. Public opinion had to be moved. Southern legislators had to be removed or moved. Um, and Charlene, uh, I, I want to read the book. I'm sure I'll love it. The, the, oh, you will. There's no. I, I recommend you read it. The documentary in American say Experience. He wants to read it. Say just he wants been, to buy it. The, <laughs> Then go buy her book. I will buy it. <laughs> okay. Buy it. The documentary <laughs> on uh, American Experience documentary that's been shown and reshown recently uh, on that's the Freedom, Freedom Riders. Riders. The Freedom Riders is mm -hmm. by Stanley Nelson. Mm -hmm. um, you should see it. It's an excellent right. movie. Okay. Kennedy Continue. did mm -hmm. say, you know, after the first sit-ins, he said, sent a message saying, um, the new way you have shown that the new way to stand up for your rights is to sit down. Now, why were, did they make a, uh, they rapidly learned the Mississippi judge was a terrible mistake. They had to, con the, they, the, I want to then say, Charlene brought into, onto the stage here, Ro Robert Kennedy, because he's a crucial part of all the questions we've asked so far. He called essentially all the signals on si civil rights while his brother was alive. Uh, the president looked to him for civil rights, not to me at all in that sense, or to Louis Martin. He looked to his brother Robert. His brother Robert, by the way, liked very much um, dealing with the uncle of <coughs> Roger Wilkins, um, who, when I, when, I, when I went to see the uncle, uh, head of the NAACP. Roy Wilkins. To, Roy Wilkins mm -hmm. to support uh, Kennedy. He said, well, let me tell you that this, well, don't let it take you all the way to, um, LBJ, but he said, Harris, if I'm honest, I will tell you that the one person who I think has fire in his belly because of what he's seen in the South to end it is Lyndon Johnson. And then he said, but don't worry. He said, my, my wife uh, is not only a Roman Catholic, but passionately in love with John Kennedy, and she wouldn't sleep with me if, if I didn't support John Kennedy. Uh, <laughs> You can okay. see why Kennedy had an affinity toward Roger's uh, uh, uncle. Um, Robert Kennedy, Robert, Robert Kennedy, uh, Burke Marshall uh, is the third key person who was the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. Um, one of the wisest people I ever knew was very cautious, very concerned with making federalism work. As you know, if you followed the De dealings with Governor Wallace and the dealings with the governor of Mississippi and getting the f Mr. Greyhound um, to, to, to carry the bus to the next stage and seeing it through and seeing the, uh, all the force of the federal government through. They did everything they could to get the local police and the local government to... to and, but Harris, why was, the, why was the Freedom Rider that violence? Why was that such... Uh, it isn't just pushed. the Freedom Riders, it's the, all the sit-in, it's the four little girls in Birmingham being killed had an enormous impact. It's the fire hoses and the Birmingham experience. All of that changed them from not having civil rights as a top priority. Um, John Kennedy's draft of, this, of his inaugural address um, after this campaign to the great disappointment of Louis Martin and me and many others in the first draft that we saw two days before it was, he gave it had no reference to civil rights. 
Now, we didn't notice then, because we were focused on civil rights, he had no reference to any domestic issue whatsoever until Louis Martin and I got two words added at the last minute uh, at home. The quote we heard at the beginning of the day, we're going to support committed to human rights uh, at home and around the world. It was about 24 hours before he spoke that he added at home. His main interest in life until then had been foreign affairs. Wrote a book about it at 19 or 20, Why England Slept. Uh, he had to, uh, uh, he, he had, I never had any doubt that he wanted to end segregation, but I had plenty of doubt as to what priority he would put okay. until, until the protest movement in blood on too many occasions stirred him, which is, um, a, a huge historical fact. I got a couple I, I of. I just want to add on, one, one, one quick thing. Hold on and one second. The media. Whoa, whoa, the media. Oh, one second. I, I, I've been Give a moderator too. Moderator. Just, I'm gonna let you say it. <laughs> yeah, but just hold on one this. second. Okay. I got to move this because we've got questions here. So I need to get you know just something to a couple of conclusions that need to be made here so that people can follow this. One is that. Uh, the, so what you have said is that he came cumulatively after all of these incidents happened to move toward civil rights, moving away from foreign from foreign affairs as his priority. I understand so, so that. So did his brother. Okay, got but that. But for different but, reasons. All right, let me just finish. Okay, so, I just, so that people who don't know the history understand that after the brutality was visited on the Freedom Riders, it's when he made his famous speech to America saying, this is a moral issue. First time president has said that. Move from, this is a moral issue. This then put into place the push toward the legislation. Now you may speak. Oh, well, Charlotte. <laughs> and, and it follows on to you because I, I have to say that it, it was the activism of the young people and some of the older ones, but it was also media because it was the first, and, and this is what, and you see it goes back to this foreign thing. It was still the Cold War, and when those kids got on that bus, and I have a picture of them in this book, uh, with, 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 the, with, with the bus burning and them sitting on the road choking to death from the smoke, it was the first time that the international media uh, got onto this story. And that's when the world got involved in this, and that's where the foreign issue of, of, again, the Cold War took place. And one final thing, and I'm finished. Um, they still were reluctant to support those students, and, and it was the uh, man, uh, maneuvering of the Kennedys. They secretly got the uh, voter education project to fund a voter registration drive so that they could stop these um, embarrassing to, the, to them in the world uh, activities of the movement. And that's when they, although some of SNCC was very much opposed to it, but that's when the Kennedys uh, moved the civil rights activists over into voter registration. And you still had a lot of violence, but it wasn't the same kind of, of, of um, overt uh, 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 demonstrations like you had with the Freedom Rides and the sit-ins. So you still had the Kennedy administration slowly being, um, trying to manipulate something to their advantage so that they would look better in the eyes of the entire world over and against the Soviet Union and communism. One more thing before you speak, Roger Wilkins, and that is just to put a button here so that people can follow the history because it said Kennedy and Johnson, and we have not mentioned his name except in passing, is that to say that when he pushed the civil rights 1964 legislation through, he, uh, he uh, Johnson, you're talking no, about? no, Kennedy. Then it made it, and then after he died, it made it possible then for President Johnson to be able to push forward the 1965 Voting Rights Act uh, uh, and and the 64 Civil Rights Act. He had teed it up, in other words, at that point, based on his cumulative understanding of what what was happening, based on the pressure from the streets and the courts, based on the inside pressure from the administration, based on the understanding that there was an international force to be dealt with as well. And now you may speak, Roger Wilkins. <laughs> My mother told me there would have been this, be moments like this. <laughs> Don't be on a stage with colored women. That's what she said. <laughs> uh, 
the, the, but the point that I would like to make is that from inside, I've, I don't tell the story often, but here we are in the down and dirty, so I'm going to tell you something. John Lewis of SNCC um, was beaten by officers on horseback and trudgeons in their hands. And they really beat him. And I always believed from those years that John was the bravest man I'd ever seen in my life with just unbridled courage and a quiet man, not a flash, not a big shot. And at a small meeting in the Attorney General's office, the Attorney General's name was Nic Nicholas de Belleville Katzenbach. Uh, I think he had been a professor at the Chicago uh, Law School, University of Chicago. <coughs> In any event, we're every, all the leaders in the Department who, of Justice who were involved in race at the time this conversation took place, because it was about the Freedom Riders, it was about kids thrown into parchment prison in Mississippi, it's, it was the hard time. And the Attorney General of the United States looked up and quipped, well, you know, some people say that uh, John's been hitting, hit on the head so many times he just doesn't have any sense anymore. And there were some people who tittered and laughed. I was the only black person in the room. And I said, Nick, that's just wrong. That is just, you can't say that and you can't think that. These are American citizens. They want their rights. They're doing what Americans should do. And you shouldn't denigrate them that way. Oh, I didn't mean it, Roger. I didn't mean it. And as we're walking out, uh, his PR man said to me, Congratulations. I said, I, congratulations for what? I didn't win nothing in there. He said, you got black people, got Nick to discuss black people as human beings, not as uh, legal specters out of the old books. So I, it wasn't terrible in the administration, but it wasn't easy either. And you really had to go after it, and you had to go after it hard, and you had to go after it to keep the faith, faith with Ernie. I didn't know Ernie. You, I did too, a little bit, but I didn't know Ernie. But I, you, you had to, you, you had to keep the faith brave children and the United States government is not prepared to move all forces on this kind of stuff. So, period. Okay. Um, the incident in which John Lewis was beaten on horseback was in Selma, Alabama. Um, it was a voting rights campaign. He is now Congressman John Lewis, for those who don't know. I have some questions here, beginning with uh, Professor Mack. You noted that both President and Robert Kennedy were comfortable around African Americans. To what would you attribute the level of comfortability displayed by both, especially Robert Kennedy, who often rallied in urban neighborhoods and traveled to South Africa, et cetera? Well, I, um, I mean, one thing not to you know, discount about both the President and his brothers, that they, um, uh, they came from Boston. Um, Needless to say, it's a place where there were many white people who were not comfortable around black people. Uh, that would be an understatement. Um, <laughs> and they were. 
Um, it's hard to say why that's so, um, but there, there are many things on which we can be maybe less than satisfied with the early years of the Kennedy administration, but that's one thing that distinguished them from many people who were around them here in Massachusetts, and certainly distinguished them from um, most of the predecessors in federal office. Um, so I don't know where it comes from. Um, I would say Robert Kennedy probably felt it more. Um, back to the time when he was a, uh, he went to law school at the University of Virginia, of course, which was a southern law school, and even at UVA, uh, he put himself out. Um, I think he had a confrontation, I think, he w with the president of the university over racial segregation at the University of Virginia. So I think uh, Robert Kennedy um, clearly felt it. Um, John Kennedy felt it in a certain way, too. Um, and even though they didn't always do as much as they might have, um, that feeling that um, that the ability to interact socially with black people was, um, was something that they had. And they thought it was a moral issue, that black people couldn't get served in the lunch counter. It just seemed inconceivable to them. Um, and certainly that's part of what finally moved the president to condemn segregation in moral terms in the middle of 1963. I think you also have to say that the difference, the, the change in Robert Kennedy was enormous, uh, made enormous by the murder of his brother. Hmm. He really became a different kind of person. And uh, the one thing I'll say is this. I said to Marion Edelman, who was a black woman who was done doing very good civil rights work in Mississippi. And uh, uh, when Robert Kennedy started running for Senate president, I remember what he was running for, but uh, she supported him. Marion supported him. And I said, Marion, why did you support Robert Kennedy after all the stuff we've had with him? She said, Roger, we were down in a very poor place, a poor black place in Mississippi. The black people were so poor, and the kids were dirty, and they were, and they were just, they just kind of gooey. And he came in there. And he walked around, and he picked up those children, and he patted their heads, and he gave them water, and he held them to his chest. She said, I wouldn't do that. She said, and that's why I'm for him. <laughs> and when marrying is for you, that's a good thing. Uh, is there not a dichotomy between those who have many responsibilities and who must be elected, i.e. presidents, and people who are pushing a particular issue, i.e. the Gandhis, the MLK juniors, and it is and is it thus true that those such as presidents will never move as quickly as those championing an issue want them to? Could I <clears throat> answer is yes. <laughs> the, the, um, uh, the, the, I, I was present when Kennedy, you know, there's the joke about Franklin Roosevelt being persuaded some big move needed to be made, and he said, I agree with you completely. Now go out and force me to do it. Uh, now, that's a good one. Kennedy didn't say that. I was present when he gave the bad news in a private session to King that they would not be introducing civil rights legislation in the first Congress, contrary to the platform. And it was a, a major moment, and for a long time they argued reasonably. Uh, King never made uh, Kennedy comfortable. Roy Wilkins did, although Roy Wilkins may have pushed harder than King did. It was a remarkable exchange on just the point you made. Uh, Kennedy said, look, we know there's no chance for the bill to move. The Southern opponents have m far, far more votes to keep a filibuster and to make it impossible to pass. To push it now would lose our capital for the civil rights idea and for ourselves. Um, it doesn't make sense. So we need to do everything we can do short of legislation. And uh, 
King pressed for a new Emancipation Proclamation that would be across the board set of actions of the boldest kind, and Kennedy wasn't ready for it. When we left, um, Kennedy said, I mean, Martin Luther King, as we went out of the White House grounds, he said, you know, I had hoped that he was going to be the president that had the understanding to understand this problem, the political skill to solve it, and the moral passion and urgency to see it through. And he said, I'm really convinced that he's got the first two, and we'll have to see about the last one. Mm -hmm. And Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton said the Constitution wasn't adopted because of the argument of the Federalists. It was adopted because of the harsh logic of events. And you could say that the Kennedys started way down toward ground zero in terms of understanding or commitment to priority to civil rights. By the time John was killed, and even far more by the time Robert Kennedy was killed, um, they, they were way up there, and they were uh, committed as in ways that uh, no president had really been on the firing line um, committed before. But Harris, yeah, there, was a, there was a thing in that administration that read be in the beginning they were they were dumb i mean just really almost ignorant well, no wait wait i think so too but they <laughs> thought one of the things they, they started talking to me but they were talking they thought i was roy's kid and they didn't know roy didn't have any kids and then i then did that i was his roy's nephew so they send they'd send messages to Roy. And, uh, and uh, I have to say, Jonathan tried it too. And they came to me, and they said, why, why are they doing this stuff in Birmingham? And, and, and kids are out of school, and the, People are being beat on the heads with co cops beating them. And so a major Kennedy domestic issue in civil rights guy came to me very quietly at a party. I barely knew him. And he said, is there any way to talk to Roy Wilkins? He said, your father. And, uh, uh, to get them to really stop this in Birmingham. He said to me, it's a terrible thing. It is just, he got very, it's a terrible thing to, to, to put those kids in the street and they should be in school. I said, you know something? These kids are learning self-involvement. They are learning that they can control their own world. They are changing the world and it's more than any lesson they will ever treat those teach those kids in those crummy segregated schools that they prepare for them i'm telling you that was the way they were the so let me let me ask what, this what, question hold, hold on one second let me ask this question then because i've got to get lyndon johnson's name in this conversation <laughs> <laughs> okay before we end and we're at the end and that is, is it fair or accurate then that Lyndon Johnson receives, I would say, most of the credit for civil rights, I don't want to say hero, but president affiliated, associated with civil rights, uh, if President Kennedy, however dumb he was at the beginning, came around at the end and teed up this legislation? Is that accurate and fair? No, I, w I want to say that Kennedy, if he was anything, he wasn't dumb. But on this issue, um, Chris Matthews' book, I recommend, you'll see that he stresses how Irish he was. It was not Southern legislators primarily that slowed them or made them very cautious. It was their assessment of what the white backlash in the North would, and West would be. We're going to see be. that. I want you to answer and my question it, about Lyndon Johnson, though. And Lyndon Johnson, <laughs> when he signed the, civil rights, the first Civil Rights Act, he said something like, we Democrats have lost the South for the next 20 or three generations. Um, the, Lyndon knew what it was like in the South. 
the Kennedys were uh, scared, uh, and South Boston's uh, reaction to segregation was not quite as violent as Birmingham, but it was uh, shocking. And um, they like Lincoln about Emancipation Proclamation. You so know, is did that the fair? best is timing? It, no, okay. I think it's not fair okay, to, that's my question. to the <laughs> to the responsiveness okay. of, of the Kennedys. Johnson uh, was wonderful, but he 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 coasted on the tragedy of Kennedy's with all of his skill. Um, he he oh, deserves the most total res respect for the achievement of piloting it through. All but right. it was all those events that happened before, including the Kennedy's commitment. All right, I want Roger, if you would answer that, and then I want Kenneth to answer that. We are at the end, so I'm gonna ask you to be brief all and right, pithy. Just, just <laughs> briefly recap your question. And that it is it fair and accurate, or accurate, or both, that Lyndon Johnson pretty much gets the credit for being the civil rights president on legislation <laughs> or that was teed up by the Kennedys, some would say. When Lyndon Johnson became president, um, happened that my uncle was visiting me in Washington. And he said, um, this is going to be good. And I said, you kidding me? What do you mean it's going to be good? This old southern guy, he talks all that southern talk. I said, that guy is not going to be. Roy said, you're wrong. You're just wrong. This man cares. I've worked with him through the civil rights bill that we got, the first one since the, the Civil War. And he, his heart was in it, his spirit was in it. He cares, Roger, he cares, you're wrong. My uncle rarely said you're wrong, because I was his beloved brother's only kid. And so, and he was really sweet to me, but he said you're wrong. This man cares, he's got a heart, and he can be pretty mean to get what he wants. So it is fair that he should be uh, I, called the civil rights president in I some think way. that I think it's very fair. All I right. think he really cared. Kenneth Mack. I'd say it's fair, but I'd say for slightly different reasons. Um, Johnson was a political pragmatist like, like Kennedy. And I, I don't think that if Johnson had gotten the nomination in 1960 that he would have moved with any more dispatch than Kennedy. Uh, Johnson took office at a different time. Um, I would give Johnson credit, though, for his legislative acumen. I mean, he had experience in the Senate that Kennedy did not. And of course, um, as, ever, as most people know, it took a lot of work to get the 64 Act through. He had to get it out of the House without it getting amended to death in ways that would cause it to not pass and you had to get it through the Senate, where um, no filibuster had ever been uh, broken with a closure of motion. And you had to accomplish that. Um, and Johnson worked tireless be tirelessly behind the scenes to accomplish that. He met with Richard Russell immediately upon taking office and said, Russell, I'm going to run over you. Um, <laughs> Kennedy never said that. Um, so I would give Johnson credit, uh, not for an additional commitment, because I don't know that his commitment was any greater than the Kennedy's, but I think for having the legislative acumen to get the thing passed. And it was really, really hard to get the thing passed. Five months of debate to get it through. Nothing else was going to be considered while this thing was, was being considered. And Johnson did it. But Johnson, um, I think you're... And Roger Wilkins, if I may. <laughs> We're at the end, and I want Charlene hunter Gall's voice to be the last on this, and I want you to answer the question from the audience. This person writes, I read your book many years ago and was moved by your story. How did what happened to you shape your decision in years to come and shape your career? It's all in this book. <laughs> Two things, no, but, but on Lyndon Johnson, I will say, no, it, it shaped me... Uh, I couldn't be an activist as a journalist, but I could be a passionate reporter for the things that I was seeing. And at the time that I entered, black people were portrayed in ways that were unrecognizable to themselves. And throughout my career, I have tried to portray all people in ways that are recognizable to themselves. Now on Lyndon Johnson, very quickly, 
in my book, To the Mountaintop. It's written for young readers. So yo those of you in this audience, it's for you to understand everything that we've been talking about because there isn't anything that we've talked about today that isn't in here, but it's in your, in terms that you can understand. And there is Lyndon Johnson's speech, which is a wonderful piece of oratory when he passed the Civil Rights Act. And, and I would encourage you to go back and, and read it because you'll get some sense of the heart that he put into it because this wasn't a speech that was put together by a committee. He wrote it. And so I think to go to your point, he, he believed in this, but he was also, like all of these politicians, you gotta realize politics is about real politic. And you learn that word and you can Google it. That's the speech we're done. <laughs> Thank you said, all to my panel. Overcome. <laughs> yeah. Kenneth Mack, Roger Wilkins, Charlene Hunter-Golf, and Harris Wolford. <laughs>